Unity. Unity. Yeah. One body, one mind. One mind, one spirit. One spirit, one mind. Gotta make the world feel it. One body, one mind. One mind, one spirit. One spirit, one mind. Gotta make the world feel it. One body, one mind. One mind, one spirit. One spirit, one mind. Gotta make the world feel it. Feel it. Gotta make the world feel it. Feel it. Yeah. Gotta make the world feel it. One body, one mind. Hey, Shalom family, Most High in Christ. Bless you all. Happy Sabbath. Uh, giving all praises to the Most High in Christ for this opportunity once again uh, to have the opportunity to bring out this word to you. Uh, today's class, uh, Smitten with Madness and the Effects of Sin on the Mind. Uh, all right, so we're going to begin in the book of Deuteronomy, 28th chapter. And we're going to start with verse 15. Now, for you all who are new to these classes, in Deuteronomy 28, it's explaining the blessings and curses that was going to come upon the children of Israel for either their obedience or disobedience. So now we're going to read the verses concerning disobedience. Let's begin in verse 15. This is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 28 and verse 15. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So what you're going to find out is that mental illness was a curse put upon us because of our disobedience. And we're going to uh, begin to examine some of the traits of this. Uh, jump on down to verse 28. Verse 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope at noonday as a blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore. And no man shall save thee. So listen to what the scripture is saying. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonish, astonishment of heart. And thou shalt grope and... I'm sorry, I can't see. Shall grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. Thou shalt only be oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. So, this is the beginning of mental illness. Now, before I go back and explain these verses, I want to read on down, and then it's going to help color in the picture. Verse 30. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Thou shalt build a house, and thou shalt not dwell therein. Thou shalt plant a vineyard, and shalt not gather the grapes thereof. Thine ox shall be slain before thine eyes, and thou shalt not eat thereof. Thine eyes shall be violently taken away from before thy face, and shall not be restored to thee. Thy sheep shall be given to thine enemies, and thou shalt have no, none to rescue them. Thy sons and thy daughters shall be given unto another people, and thine eyes shall look, and fail with longing for them all the day long. And there shall be no might in thy hand. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt not, excuse me, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. Read on. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes which thou shalt see. Now watch this. So let's go back. I want you to read verse 34 one more time. Verse 34. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. So it says, and thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. Now, we attribute the word mad to being angry. But in this case, I'm going to use it into madness. And I'm going to explain why. When we go back up and we read verse 28, read it again. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 28. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. It says the Lord shall smite thee with madness, with blindness. That blindness is not talking about blind, you can't see. Blind meaning you don't understand why. You're not able to figure out why we're in these conditions. How do we do? That's why it says the next verse, and we grope at noonday. Now try to wrap your mind around this concept. 
verse 30. Thou shalt betroth a wife, and another man shall lie with her. Think of the mental state that you're put into. But you are betrothed to a woman, and before you lay with her, another man lies with her. It says, Thou shalt build a house, but, and thou shalt not dwell therein. You save, you work hard, you build your house, but you're not able to live in the home that you built. You plant a vineyard, but you're not able to reap the grapes or the benefits of that vineyard. Your ox, your ass, shall be violently taken away from you. And look what it says. It says, thy enemies, oh, it, says, it says, thy enemies, thou shalt have none to rescue them. And thou shalt have none to rescue them. So, your wife, your land, your home, your cattle, your vineyard, and no one there to rescue them. It says, thy sons and daughters shall be given to another people, and thy eyes shall look and fail with longing for them all the day long, and there shall be no might in thy hand. Your children taken from you, and you don't have the capability or the strength or the power to take your children back. Generally, when we're mad, what results from that is anger, fighting. God said you don't have that might. So what happens to all that energy, all that trauma that you experienced, or we as a people experience? It plagues the mind. That's why when you get to verse uh, 34, read that again. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 34. So that thou shalt be mad for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. And you're going to be mad, frustrated, and it's going to affect the psyche. God, and that stuff is generational. To this day, we're still feeling the effects of that. Today, they call it PTSD. That we feel the effects of what happened. God said, I'm going to punish you. But that punishment is going to, I'm going to punish you in the plagues of the mind. Because for our generation right now, we didn't experience going away on slave ships. I never was on a slave ship before. My wife wasn't violently taken away from me. But the effects of what's written here still plagues us today. And we're going to explain. Now I want you to jump up and read verse 33. Verse 33. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up. And thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. It says we're going to only be oppressed and crushed always. You know why? Let's go back. I want you to read verse 29. This is why. Verse 29. And thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in dark. It says with this madness, with this uh, curses that we are under, we're going to grope. We're going to be as a blind gropeth in darkness. Try to imagine. As a person that's blind, groping, trying to find their way, we as a people, the same thing. We go from religion to religion to politics to crime. We look for all different ways out of our situation. The only way out of it is repentance. These things happen to us because of sin, and God said, I'm going to make it plague you in the mind. Do you know the act, a violent act against a person. And I'm not talking about murder, but a violent act against a person, uh, against a woman, rape. Let's use that. That act that happened to her, after the rape is over, she still carried the residuals of that hair. Her body physically can be okay again in some cases. But the mental plague of the mind is what never goes away. That's what we're experiencing today. You know how I know we experience it? Because if you are black, Hispanic, Native American Indians, you've experienced this before. And I'm talking about you being legit, not no criminal. As soon as you see a police, you sit up straight. You make sure your seatbelt's on. You're looking at your mirror to if they're coming. And you didn't do anything. Why? Because you're still under that same curse. You're still suffering from that same mental, smitten with that madness. So back to the point about groping. It says, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in darkness, and thou shalt not prosper in thy ways. And everything you try to do 
we as a people, we are not able to come out of our conditions. In thy ways, and thou shalt only be oppressed and spoil evermore, and no man shall save thee. So, what do we do? We turn to therapist. We turn to Oprah Winfrey, Alana Von Zahn, Dr. Phil. God said, those things are not going to fix your condition. To, to reverse this, we must begin to keep the commandments. To reverse this, the madness, the astonishment of heart. The blindness. To do that, it must come back to the commandments. Now watch this. Jump to verse 65, I think it is. Uh, yeah, 65. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 65. And among these nations, thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the sole of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And what? And sorrow of mind. The Lord said, and among these nations thou shalt find no ease or no rest. We're not getting ease. We're being killed in the street daily. There's no let up from them. If anything, Esau's turning it up. It says, thou shalt find no ease. Neither shall the, shall the sole of thy foot have rest. Meaning what? You're going to Continue working, working with rigor. You're not going to find, your feet is not going to find no rest. But thou shalt, I'm sorry, but thou, huh? But thou shalt give thee there a trembling heart. That trembling heart is that mind, that mind that's afraid. You know what it is for people when we were God's chosen, when we are God's chosen people, when we rule the earth, to turn around and have to have a trembling heart afraid of every move we make, every decision we do. We are in fear of losing our job. We're in fear of getting murdered. We're in fear of driving down the street. We're in fear of whatever we do, we have a level of fear that we suffer from. You trying to switch this mic up? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Thank you. That's better. We're in fear. So it says, read that verse again. Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy, chapter 28, verse 65. And among these nations, thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. And failing of eyes. That's that same blindness we were just talking about. You know what that is called? That's called depression. We're going to suffer depression and sorrow of mind. Read on. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night, and shall have no assurance of thy life. Do you understand that? When you live a life where you have no assurance as if you're going to make it through the next day, you have no assurance that if you get pulled over right now and you have and you're legit, you didn't do nothing, you have no criminal record, you don't have no weapon, you know you sit in doubt that this officer is not going to shoot you? Do you understand what it plays on the psyche of the mind? And God knew that. God said, I'm gonna meditate terrorists. Because of your disobedience, I'm gonna plague you in the mind. Watch this. Now, with that plague in the mind, what what turns from that? Watch this real quick. Um, I want to go to Real quick, I have a clip real quick I want to show. Give me the one on Stockholm Syndrome. And can you put it up on the screen so I can see it? Stockholm Syndrome. What is it and how does it apply in therapy? This is one of the most fascinating 
topics I've gotten to research thus far. So thank you to all of you who requested it. And in all honesty, I knew what Stockholm Syndrome was, but I didn't really know the applications or ramifications of it within my clinical therapy practice. And so this was so interesting. Stockholm Syndrome is named after a bank robbery that happened in 1973 in Stockholm, Sweden. The, there were bank employees that were kept for six days. They were first wrapped in dynamite and thrown into the bank vault. And the thing that happened that shocked everybody is that throughout those six days, those captive people wrapped in dynamite for some reason became eerily attached to their captors. They felt bad for them. They even turned away police and assistants to get them out of there. They were not helpful at all. And even once released, some of them still kept in touch with their captors and wouldn't testify against them in court. And so everybody thought, what the hell is going on? Why won't they tell us anything? Why are they acting like they were caring and nice and they care about what happens to them? What gives? What they learned is that psychologically, in order to get through terrifying situations, we often attach to our captors as a way to almost survive it, thinking, well, you know, I care about them, I understand what's going on with them, see, they're, they're keeping me alive, they're really nice, and in a way, by being nice to our captors, we're increasing the chances that we will live through it. So, oddly enough, it's like our brain's way of helping us get through an abusive or scary and traumatic situation. This applies in a clinical therapy practice more along the lines of people who are in controlling or abusive relationships. For example, we find a lot of battered men or women will refuse to press charges against their spouse or loved one who abused them. Many even bail them out of jail after the police have taken them in because they've abused them. Now let's get into the fascinating part and the reason that Stockholm Syndrome takes hold. There are four factors that need to be in place and need to happen, so let's talk about them. The first, and the kind of the obvious one, is that we must feel threatened, either physically or psychologically, and we have to believe that the abuser slash captor will actually act out on that threat. The way that we find this happens most commonly is indirectly. Maybe it's breaking things, throwing things around. They may even indirectly talk about harming someone or something that you really care about, like threatening to get rid of a prized possession or to harm an animal that you love and care for. The abuser's goal is actually to get you to just believe that the harm that they could do is possible and it may be imminent. The second condition, and this is where it starts to, you can see how it can psychologically shift for the person oh, being abused. For a second. So, okay, I'm going to come back to that in a second. So now, Stockholm Syndrome, which really, that's, that's a name they put on in 1973. We lived through that already. Now watch this real quick. Give me that Lamentations. The, the book of Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 17. As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help. And our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. It says we watched for a nation that could not save us. Uh, let, uh, one second. Let me, I want to get there with you. Lamentations. I'm sorry, I went too far. Bear with me. 4, 17. Watch this. Read again. Lamentations, chapter 4, verse 17. As for us, our eyes as yet failed for our vain help. In our watching, we have watched for a nation that could not save us. Read on. They hurt our steps that we cannot go in our streets. Our end is near. Our days are fulfilled. For our end is come. So, look. We trust in a nation and we look for a nation that could not save us. This is no different than how we were in Egypt. Watch this real quick. Let's go to the book of Exodus chapter 1. And then we'll go back to Deuteronomy in a second. Exodus 1, I want you to read verse 10. This is the book of Exodus, chapter 1 and verse 10. Come on, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply. And it come to pass that when there falleth out any war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us and so get them up out of the land. Mm -hmm. Therefore did they set over them taskmasters to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh treasure cities, Python and Ramses. But the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were grieved because of the children of Israel. And the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor. This is captivity. This is slavery. Read on. 
and they made their lives bitter with hard bondage in the mortar and in brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. Do you understand working rigor means working you to death? Hard bondage? That's called slavery. So guess what? We were in slavery in Egypt. Now look what happens. Go to Numbers 11. Now we get delivered. The Most High delivers us out of Egypt. Through the hand of Moses and Aaron, we walk through the Red Sea. And look what happened. Verse 1. Numbers chapter 11 and verse 1. And when the people complained, it displeased the Lord. We began to complain. It displeased the Lord. Read on. And the Lord heard it, and his anger was kindled. And the fire of the Lord burnt among them and consumed them that they were in the uttermost parts of the camp. So you would think we came out of Egypt after serving hard bondage, bitter bondage, but we still complain. Jump on down to verse 4. Verse 4. No, no, verse, uh, I'm sorry, uh, verse 5. Verse 5. We remember the fish which we did eat in Egypt freely, the cucumbers and the melons and the leeks and the onions and the garlic. We began to reminisce on how we ate the leeks and garlics freely. That's the day they call that EBT. But here's the thing. Here's the, here's the, here's the smitten with madness. Did we forget that we worked to, for bit and bit of bondage in Egypt? Did we forget that? We were so conditioned because of the abuse. That's when the Mosai said we were going to be smitten with madness. We would even consider thinking that life in Egypt was better than being free. Now watch this. Stockholm, watch this. I want you to go back to Deuteronomy 28. And I want to revisit one verse. Give me a second. Do I have me 28? And the verse I want. Uh, I'm too far. Let me go back. I have to go back to the page. I want you to read verse 33. Yes, sir. Deuteronomy chapter 28 and verse 33. The fruit of thy land and all thy labors shall a nation which thou knowest not eat up, and thou shalt be only oppressed and crushed always. And we will only be oppressed and crushed always. Watch this. Ecclesiastes 7. The book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 7. Verse 7. Ecclesiastes, chapter 7 and verse 7. Surely oppression make it a wise man mad. So a wise man, surely oppression will make a wise man mad. Now we say mad is angry. But that mad also could be bring apart madness because we didn't have no power in our hand to stop the condition. Do you know the frustration? You, have you ever suffered this before that you get so angry and you know you can't do anything about it that you feel that trembling in you? Imagine a lifetime of that. Imagine somebody telling you, hey, move over and lay with your wife and you got to go sit out on the porch. How do you release that anger? You don't. It's called torment. It's called post-traumatic stress that you carry on. The hatred we build up and that same enemy, just like a dog, you could take a dog right now and you can beat it and beat it and beat it. But if you feed it, it will always be loyal to you. It will even turn and bite somebody else that's never done anything to it, but it won't hurt you. Watch this. Surely oppression makes a wise man mad. Here we go. We're oppressed people. We were in slavery. We was beaten, robbed, raped, murdered. And here go the gift. You can sit on the front of the bus now. You can drink out the water fountain. And what do we do? We've made strides. Look at us. We're one. That's, that was the payback after 400 years of slavery. So you're talking about these people in Stockholm were six days. We have 400 years of slavery. What do you think it plays on the psychology or the way we think? Generational curses. Opposed to somebody who spent six days. They gave a whole 
study for six days and we got 400 years of it. And then they turn around and say, here's a gift. You know what? You're free. You can vote now. Here's a job. You can drink out this water fountain now. And think we don't carry all that residual in us. So surely oppression makes a wise man mad. And it says, and a gift destroyeth the heart. So now our minds are destroyed. They broke the mind. We live in fear, in doubt. What does it produce? Isaiah 51. Isaiah 51. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 19. 19. Yes, sir. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 19. These two things are come unto thee, who shall be sorry for thee, desolation and destruction, and the famine and the sword. By whom shall I comfort thee? He says, these two things are come upon thee, has come unto thee, who shall, who shall be sorry for thee? Desolation, destruction, and the, and the famine, and the sword. By whom shall I comfort thee? God said, these things came upon us. Why? Because of our disobedience. And what did it produce? These conditions. Read on. Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a net. And that's what it produced. It produced what you see today that Negro on the corner, full of rage and fury. But he's not going to attack his attacker. He's not going to attack the people that, that, that put him into these conditions. He's going to attack one that looks just like him because he's been conditioned like that. So when you see your brothers in the corner, you know they got problems. You ever seen this? If you grew up in the cities, you've seen this. You've seen a brother walking down the street, his pants sagging, he had headphones in, and he's rapping to himself, waiting to the light. Spin bars, whatever you think he's doing. He's smitten with madness. It takes somebody who's smitten with mental disorder to be dark as midnight and put in yellow hair in their hair, this woman's, fake hair, synthetic hair in their hair, green lipstick, blue eyeshadow, no bra, it takes, a, it, it takes a certain person to believe, a certain caliber of people to believe that abortion is all right. I was listening to Clubhouse this week, and the argument was about, you cannot hold me accountable for committing murder. Only a broken mind can think like that. And the argument is, come on, sister, stop killing our babies. No, it's because the man is this. I'm like, wow, we're arguing. Only a broken mind. Only a mind smitten with madness. And this is all because of sin. We think like that. So it says, um, read that verse again, verse 20. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 20. Thy sons have fainted. They lie at the head of all the streets as a wild bull in a the net. They are full of the fury of the Lord. They, this the fear of God. His judgments are against us. And we're exp that's why he's wild. A wild animal on the corners. Because God's judgment. It's a broken mind that's behaving like that. Watch this. Let's go Isaiah 30. We're not going to go too far back. Isaiah, Isaiah 30 verse 12. Isaiah chapter 30 and verse 12. Wherefore thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because he despised this word and trust in oppression and perverseness and stay thereon. God said, listen. We trust in oppression. The same ones we oppressed by, we trust in that. We trust in the perverseness. And guess here's the part, and we stay there on. Guess what? We don't want to way out. Watch this. Jump up in the chapter, verse 9. Verse 9. That this is a rebellious people, lying children, children that will not hear the law of the Lord. You know, which say to the seers, see not. They don't want to see out of this situation. They don't want the truth of the matter. They don't want to hear the laws. They'd rather stay the way they are. Read on. And to the prophets, prophesy not unto us right things, 
Speak unto us smooth things. Prophesy deceit. Prophesy. They'd rather hear lies than hear the truth. Who would want to hear lie other than the truth? A person that's smitten with madness. Read on. Get ye out of the way. Turn aside out of the path. Cause the Holy One of Israel to cease from before us. They don't want the Lord. They don't want the truth. They don't want correction. Read on. Wherefore, thus saith the Holy One of Israel, because ye despise this word and trust in oppression, because you despise the laws of God and you trust in the oppression and the oppression he put upon us was because of our di our disobedience. That's why our women were taken from us and raped. Our children was carried into captivities. Our land, our homes, everything was taken from us. And that's why God said, I'm going to smite thee with madness. You know why? Because there's going to be a frustration. And there'll be no might in your hand. And I'm going to plague your mind with this. But we understand the way out of this. If we remember who we are, we bethink ourselves, then we know that judgment is coming for them. Our minds will be let free. Free from what? From the burdens that was put upon us because of our own behavior. So this mental, this mental, this uh, PTSD that we suffer from, there's a cure. We must come back to the laws of God. What, did you finish that verse? Yes, sir. Okay, watch this. I want to go from that to uh, Psalms 83. Watch this. Hmm? Yes. Psalms chapter 83 and verse 2. For lo, thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up their head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, come and let us cut them off from bringing a nation that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. So our enemies knew, you know what? They sinned against God. Look at them. Look at what they turned out to become. But we have to make sure that they're cut off from their God. They have taken crafty counsel. They consulted together. How do we destroy them? We must keep them cut off from knowing who they are. Because if they know who they are, they remember that. They remember they have to keep the laws. They will not be that wild. They will not be that guy on the corner. That's the reason why right now on Instagram, what's happening, you can't even have IsraelUnited.org in your, in your bio link anymore. They don't face, but they don't want that. Why? Because they're trying to stop that connect being made, which is what? We are the children of Israel, and we must keep the laws. If you do that, guess what happens? Your mind begins to reform. The madness, the behavior change. Think about the madness of people suffering. When you have parents home doing drugs with their children. You got mothers home butt naked twerking with their babies there. We are a base people. We are a base people. But these laws are being taught by us. It's teaching our people to come back to their right frame of mind. That's why the nations laugh at us. We're, we're, we're made mockery of, we're made jokes at. Why? Because we're, we're broken here. Watch this. Um, come let us come up from, from being a people. First Maccabees 1. Watch this. 141. This is the book of First Maccabees. Chapter 1 and verse 41. Moreover, King Antiochus wrote to his whole kingdom, that all should be one people, and everyone should leave his laws. So all the heathen agreed according to the commandment of the king. Yea, many also of the Israelites consented to his religion, and sacrificed unto idols, and profaned the Sabbath. For the king had sent letters by messengers unto Jerusalem and the cities of Judah, that they should follow the strange laws of the land, and forbid burnt offerings and sacrifice. And drink offerings in the temple, and that they should profane the Sabbaths and festival days, and pollute the sanctuary and the holy people, set up altars and groves, and chapels of idols, and sacrifice swine's flesh and unclean beasts, that they should also leave their children uncircumcised, 
and make their souls abominable with all manner of uncleanness and profanation. Here's the point. To the end that they might forget the law and change all the ordinances. To the end that we might forget the law. They made decrees that to the end that we might forget the laws. Forget the laws. They do not want us keeping the laws. They know because we broke the laws, we were smitten with madness. And if we keep them away from the laws, they will continue in that same state. So, you know what? Let's make a decree. That's that crafty counsel. Keep them in bondage. Keep them working. Keep them in a mental state where they cannot see an end. Give them little gifts. Here's a little, here's a little Social Security. Here's a little EBT. But never, never allow them to regain consciousness of who they are. Now watch this. Men's minds. Go to the book of Wisdom of Solomon. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7. I want you to read verse 15. Let's jump on down to verse 20. Yes, sir. Wisdom of Solomon chapter 7 and verse 15. God hath granted me to speak as I would and to, the, and to conceive as is meet for the things that are given me because it is he that leadeth unto wisdom and directed the wise. Right. God gave Solomon this understanding. Jump on down to verse 20. Verse 20. The natures of living creatures. He gave him the understanding the nature of living creatures. And the furies of wild beasts. And the furies of wild beasts. Read on. The violence of winds. He gave him to understand how the weather works. And the reasonings of men. How men think. He gave, today that's called psychology. He gave Solomon the understanding of the way men think. Read on. The diversities of plants. And the virtues of roots. And all such things as are either secret or manifest, them I know. So he understood whatever secret or manifest. So I'm going to use, in, a, in this case, secret, the subconscious mind. The subconscious mind. How the subconscious mind works. Give me that scripture. As a man thinketh, so is he. Real quick. The That's what Sigmund Freud was doing. Working with what? The subconscious mind. Psychoanalyst. Real quick. So the scripture look for you. Remember where it's at? As a man thinketh, so see Proverbs, something like that. I'll get it real quick. Proverbs 23. Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 7. For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So he understood that. Solomon understood as a man thinketh, so is he. Understand the reasonings of men. Why do men do the things they do? Why do we behave the way we behave? These are the nations. Real quick, I want you to go up to that clip. What's the clip you had again? Yes, go back. Not the previous one. Yes. Oh, no, no, no. Give me the clip uh, uh, the, uh, with um, Sigmund Freud, real quick. Just find that for me, real quick. The subconscious mind. I'm, watch this. Okay. So while he's getting that, real quick, I want you to go to Wisdom of Solomon 17. And I want you to read, uh, read verse 1 and jump to verse 10. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 17 and verse 1. For great are thy judgments, and cannot be expressed. Therefore, unuttered souls have erred. Verse 10. They die for fear, denying that they, shall, that they saw the air, which could of no side be avoided. Verse 16. Verse 16. So then, whosoever there fell down was straightly kept, shut up in a prison without iron bars. So we read about this in Wisdom of Solomon. I'm going to get to that image in a second. It was talking about how the Most High was tormenting them. So we, uh, read, read verse 15. Verse 15. 
were partly vexed with monstrous apparitions and partly fainted, their heart failing them for a sudden fear and not looked for came upon them. So now, this was their minds playing tricks on them. This was the Egyptians when the Most High began to punish them. Their minds began to play tricks. They began to see things. Today you call it paranoia schizophrenic. They've seen things. And now the next verse says what? Verse 16. So then, whosoever that fell down was straightly kept, shut up in a prison without iron bars. What's that prison without iron bars? The mind. They were kept in that place. Now, what, real quick, I'm going to show you something. The unconscious mind. Okay, if you see what that's a glacier or an ice, what do you call it? Iceberg, right? Now, look, read that first part of it the conscious. The unconscious mind, the conscious. The small amount of mental activity we know about. The subconscious. Things we could be aware of if we wanted or tried. The unconscious. Things we are unaware of and cannot become aware of. The id is part of the unconscious mind and comprises the two instincts. Eros and Dantos. So now watch what it says. The, the conscious, the small amount of mental activity we know about. That's what we consciously think about. Things we could be aware of, sub, the subconscious things we could be aware of if we wanted to, if we wanted or tried. Things we think about. It says, and the, and the unconscious, things that we're unaware of, uh, things we are unaware of and cannot become aware of. Now that's not true. I'm, but I'm explaining a second. Sigmund Freud, what he worked on was he tried to work on the subconscious and the unconscious mind. How people think. How they reason. So things that are, so things that are trapped in their subconscious mind or their, up, or their unconscious mind is this. Watch this. Go to Ephesians. Ephesians 6. Ephesians 6, and I want you to read verse 11. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we rest not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. It says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against what? For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Right. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle against spiritual wickedness in high places. They understand to work on the subconscious mind of man. They understand to work on the part of us that we don't. That's what you watch in TV. It's programming us. It's keeping us in a certain state. They're playing. So when you watch TV, we watch it sometime thinking it's fun or joke like we'll watch like Medea or whatever. That's a programming to accept it. They can get you comfortable accepting, laughing at it, of him dressed like a woman. Guess what? Subconsciously, you're agreeing with it. We're laughing at uh, this one dressed up in drag. We're slowly agreeing with that behavior, unbeknownst to us. That's the subconscious mind that they're working in. That's their witchcraft. That's the part of that keeps us smitten with madness. Watch this real quick. Um, okay, let's go to the other clip of, of the woman. Now, in slavery. Post-traumatic slave syndrome is an explanatory theory that really looks at multi-generational trauma. One of the things that's difficult for people is their first response is, oh my God, that happened so long ago. We're talking about people being captured, shipped, sold, beaten, raped, experimented on, 
And then you have to ask the question, did the trauma continue? Yes, so 300 years of trauma, no help, freed. No help, more trauma. If it's a sustained trauma, then the, the impact of that is also sustained. When we look at multi-generational trauma, we're looking at people who are maybe victims of natural disasters and their families and their children and generations of folks who have experienced war. Uh, and we know that there are residual uh, mental, emotional, traumatic impact. And what I did was I started to look at the African American experience, starting with slavery, as a real clear, long, enduring trauma. So I started to see that there were clear connections between that survival behavior and contemporary living in African American experience. I started to see common behaviors that I took for granted as, well, cultural. There's adaptive behaviors, survival behaviors. Well, what are they? Let's just say 2019, you have a black mother and a white mother. The sons go to school together. They find themselves at a meeting. The black mother leans over to the white mother and says, I just wanted to mention to you that I noticed that your son is really doing quite well. And the white mother's response is, oh, thank you. She begins to go on and on about, he won the science fair, his uncle's an astronaut. She's just oozing. She realizes the black mother's son is actually excelling her son. And she says, well, wait a minute. Your son's the one that's really coming along. And the black mother responds, oh my God, he's a handful, but oh, he just works my nerves. Now, when I'm working with African-American people, it doesn't matter what the audience is. It doesn't matter what class. If I were to ask, is she very proud while she's saying those denigrating things? And everybody laughs and goes, of course, there's a secret. Because everybody black knows that even though the black mother is going, oh my God, she's really proud. So now let's roll that scene back 300 years. And let's say this black mother is working in the fields and a white slave owner comes through and says, wow, that boy is really coming along. What is she going to say? No, he's not. He's, he's stupid. He's, he's shiftless. He can't work because I don't want you to sell him. So I denigrate them to protect them. That is called appropriate adaptation when living in a hostile environment. The little white boy, say Timmy, you know, he feels really comfortable and happy about what his mom just said about him. And Trey looks at his mom and wonders, why can't you be proud of me? Because he doesn't understand the secret yet. And by the time he learns the secret, he will have already been injured by it. Post-traumatic slave syndrome. PTSD um, is a disorder that occurs as a result of a single trauma. You don't even have to be there to actually get a diagnosis of post-traumatic stress disorder. You could just hear about something horrific happening to someone you love. So you have people who have experienced it firsthand, people who have witnessed it in their environment, right? People who are continuing to be oppressed. That exacerbates any possibility of healing. So it's not post-traumatic stress disorder because then it becomes part of uh, what we call your socialization process. So you begin to normalize a way of living and being. Everything from what we eat to what we believe it means to be a friend. You know, all of these things are colored by history. And if you don't understand it, you're going to fold in things that you've just assumed are normal. But post-traumatic stress disorder, you know, exaggerated startle response, outbursts of anger, uh, feeling a foreshortened future. There was a point where there were you know, African-American children in different urban settings that didn't expect to live to be adults because they saw so much death that they started planning their funerals like at 13, 12, as young as 10. It, when you start looking at the, the simple biology, and you start looking at the, the impact of stress on health. And while we look at general stress, you know, we know finances, you have illnesses, all these different things. How about being black? How does factoring in being black in America impact your stress level and therefore your body's ability to operate its own immune system? Because we know it compromises the immune system. Once you understand it, then you can deal with it. Because you see, it's habitual. You socialize. It becomes part of your being. So one of the ways you begin to address that multi-generational trauma is to work with the people it directly impacts, to hear from them. And when you give the people the information they, they can use, I think the first order of business is beginning to have a conversation. And the other is to educate the larger society. You have to stop the assault. So this is not purely a clinical thing. This requires social justice and change. That's where part of the healing is. It's not in a clinical setting or in a All right, we can stop this. It's in so what I want to take from that was she's explaining the generational effects of PTSD. 
And that's what we're affecting. And then she said, but there has to be a change. That change must come. Watch this. Go to Luke. Luke 4. Four eighteen. The book of Luke, chapter 4 and verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind. And the what? And recovering of sight to the blind. Read up. To set at liberty them that are bruised. bruised. So, so listen to what it says. He says, and the spirit of the Lord was, put, was, was upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. What is the, what is the good news of this Bible? That one day we're going to come out of this captivity and we're going to put in captive those that had us in slavery. The tables are going to turn. That's the good news of the, te- of the New Testament. That Christ came to redeem us from under the law. That we're going to be free. Our minds are going to be free from these plagues that's plagued us. This mental, the, 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 the mental strain, the PTSD that we're suffering. That's what it says, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Free where? Free here. It says, uh, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. The brokenhearted are the ones that's broken in the mind. To preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of sight to them that are blind, that are groping, that cannot find their way out. We tried in religion. It has not worked. We went from Islam to Christianity to everything. Seventh-day Adventist to Jehovah Witness. We went from Republican to Democrat to Obama to Trump. We tried everything. We tried singing our way out of it. We tried marching our way out of it. But guess what? We understand the, the way out of it is the repentance to break those generational curses. It says, to, uh, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. The bruise is bruised here in the mind. Now watch this. Here's part of it now. Here's part of understanding. Because she was saying, the mother was saying, oh, he's no good. He, you know, he's good. And that was a defense mechanism. Yes, but it's also damaging to that child. So we have to be very mindful of how we speak. It's called what? Verbal abuse, which brings on also PTSD. Let's go to the book of James. So our job is to not only identify it, but to teach all people how to break those curses. 3 verse 8. James chapter 3 and verse 8. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Wherewith bless, there wherewith we bless God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. So we understand that we're made after the similitude of God, then we must understand, but the tongue, no man can tame, it is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. It's telling you, what is a poison? You, you think it's, it's the verbiage, the words that you use out of your mouth, and it can destroy somebody where? In the arm? In the leg? In the mind? That's why it says, evil communication can corrupt the way somebody behaves, or good manager says. The way you communicate, what comes out of your mouth can change. It can either build somebody or it can break them. Now watch this. Go from that. Proverbs 18. Verse 21. Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Look what does it say again? Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Read on. And they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. It says, and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. Death and life is in a power of speech. So we want to understand verbal abuse that cause a, a traumatic stress, 
understand that we can breathe life into somebody or we can breathe death into somebody. That's why it says full of deadly poison. I want to go from there to uh, Proverbs 12. 12.25. Proverbs chapter 12 and verse 25. Heaviness in the heart of man make it, it to stop. It's to stoop. To stoop. So that's what? Depression. Read on. So heaviness in the heart of the man maketh him to stoop. Read on. But a good word maketh it glad. But a what? But a good word maketh it glad. But a good word maketh it glad. But a what? But a good word maketh it glad. A good word will make it glad. Glad will make what the mind glad. Watch this. Go from that to Ephesians four. Yep, uh, Ephesians four twenty nine. Ephesians chapter four verse twenty nine. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Yeah, so don't let uh, corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but let it be to the use of edifying. Let what comes out of your mouth, remember the tongue is full of deadly poison. So if we want to break these general curses and stop this 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 traumatic stress here's one way watch your speech read on I don't know drop that real quick I want to go from that uh, to Proverbs 19 verse 19 the book of Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 19 a man of great wrath shall suffer punishment. For if thou deliver him, yet thou must do it again. We don't. Hear counsel and receive instruction that thou mayest be wise in thy latter end. There are many devices in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that shall stand. We don't. The desire of a man is his kindness. And a poor man is better than a liar. That's not the scripture I'm looking for. I'm sorry. That's a proverb. I'm sorry, it, it was uh, Proverbs 29. 29 and 1. Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 1. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck. It said, A man that is often reproved will begin to harden his neck. Read on. Shall suddenly be destroyed, and that thou without remedy. It says, A man that is often reproved will begin to harden his neck. So, if, you, if your conversation, if what's coming out your mouth is not to the edifying, and you're often reproving somebody, they become stiff-necked. So now we have to find a way, especially with people that are smitten with this madness, we have to find a way to reach them, to correct them, to help them, but at the same time that they don't become callous. All these are the effects because of what? Because of sin. That's why, drop that, go to the book of James. Real quick. Bear with me. I'm going to have to look for the scripture. Hold on. Says it again. Just bear me one second. Okay, uh, James three seventeen. James chapter three and verse seventeen. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Read on. James chapter 4 verse 1. From whence cometh wars and fightings among you. So we know, the, the, we know the wisdom from above is first peaceable and pure. 
It says, and fruits of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Now here's the point. From whence cometh wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members. So now if there's contention, there's something that's warring where inside here. If there's, that's why we have black on black crime. Why? Because there's a, there's a stress that's on our mind. Something that we're plaguing us and we don't know how to deal. That's why all, all men become very, all women become very hardened as people. So when it says, once cometh wars and fighting amongst you, don't they come from the lust that's warring inside of you? Why is it warring inside of you? Because of our conditions. So I'm going to go from that. Now watch this real quick. I want to go from that uh, to Luke. No, that's not it. I'm sorry, I got the... I'm on the wrong page. This is not exactly what I'm looking for. Oh, Ephesians 4, 22. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. And it says you put off what? That you put off concerning the former conversation. The old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. It says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. So it says that you put off the former conversation. That old man. So the Lord said, that old man we have to get rid of. The old man, the old way of thinking. That former conversation is why? Out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaketh. You're going to reveal who you are. By how you speak. So back to that PTSD that I was talking about. That old form of conversation is one of what? Contention, strife. Why is that? Why do you think people come back from war and, and they, they're wound up? And I, I experienced that with my, my oldest brother. He came back from the military. And I came in the room in the morning. He jumped up. He grabbed me. And it was because of all the trauma he experienced. And I was young then. All the trauma he experienced when he was in the military of uh, people, I guess, his sergeants, whatever, them attacking them in the bed or whatever, that he jumped up out of fear. And this is a year or two after he came home. Why? That was what still was in him. So now let's go back. It says that read verse 20, uh, 2 again. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 22. That you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Read on. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. And that's what we, our job is to help those people put on that new man, to break that cycle. Watch this. Go from that to, um, uh, to Psalms 52. Psalms 52, and I want verse, give me one second. Let's show what verse it is. Psalms 52, give me verse, uh, verse 4. Psalms chapter 52 and verse 4. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. It says, thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. Read on. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. So, so, so the Lord said, thou lovest all devouring words. So if we have a tongue where we devour one another, it's causing damage. It's continuing that same vicious cycle. Why do people love devouring words? Why do they speak like that? Because they themselves are afflicted in the mind. It says, Thou lovest devouring words. Read that verse again. Psalm chapter 52 and verse 4. Thou lovest all devouring words, O thou deceitful tongue. You know. God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Say, Law. Watch this. Go to, he says, he's going to kill you. Sirach 28. Twenty-eight, seventeen. Sirach chapter twenty-eight, verse seventeen. 
The stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones. But the stroke of the tongue does what? Breaketh the bones. Read on. Many have fallen by the edge of the sword, but not so many as have fallen by the tongue. Now, let me say this a, a real quick. Um, now, read on, read on, finish it. Verse 19. Woe is he that is defended from it, and have not passed through the venom thereof. Now, now watch this real quick. I want you to read verse 17 again. Verse 17. The stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh the bones. So it's letting you know what's communicated can destroy. Now, in here it's referring to the tongue. But I'm talking about in communication in general. Whatever is communicated, however you communicate, it causes damage to the mind. We take for granted what we feed our spirit with. It being television, movies, music, conversations. Those tongue, that communication, it weighs on us. So if we want to come out of these generational curses concerning what I'm talking about now is verbal communication abuse, we have to, one, watch what we take into our spirit, what we allow we take in. Two, how we communicate out a message. And that goes with watching TV or talking. Because if the scripture just says, the stroke of the whip maketh marks in the flesh, but the stroke of the tongue breaketh bones, do you think the bones is literal bones? No. It's too much your mind. Read on. Verse 18. Many have fallen by the edge of the sword, but not so many as have fallen by the tongue. It says many have fallen by the edge of the sword. Many have died because you know with a sword, it kills you. But it's telling you that the tongue also kills. It kills the person where? Right here. You think you can talk somebody to death? It's not to my physical death. Meaning that your tongue is going to actually kill them. Not, not directly, but indirectly, you break them. That's what Esau did with us. Everything black was bad. You're no good. You're this and that. After a while, the darker the person was, the more we diss him. Look how dark he is. After he's made up the similitude of God. Look at his hair. They show you white, long, straight hair. We see a brother with, with, with woolly hair. Oh, you got nappy hair. We, our sisters, we, we began to what? Perpetuate the message that was told to us to break one another. We're doing their bidding at this point. So I want to shift from there to um, other type of uh, mental illness. Watch this. Let's go from that to Jude. Book of Jude. Neither they that separate themselves. Jude, verse 19. These be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. It says, these be they. This is a disassociated, I, this is a, um, I forgot what you call it again. Um, I don't want to use introvert, but, well, I don't, let me not use the word yet, because I, I, I forgot the exact word I want to use. Say again? Recluse. Now, that's good. That's not the word either. But okay. These be they that separate themselves. Sensual, not having the spirit. Those that, ref that remove themselves. That is also a disorder when you keep away from the body, from your strength. You move yourself away. Many times people do that. Why? Because they're evil surmising. They think people have it in for them. Watch this real quick. Go from that to 1 Timothy 4. Uh, Antisocial. That's it right there. Thank you. Uh, 1 Timothy 6 and 4. 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 4. He is proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and stripes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmises. Cometh what? Evil surmisings. We are. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds. 
what I want out of that. We don't finish it. And destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such, withdraw thyself. So look what it says. The one I want at this is the evil surmisings. To, to surmise evil of a person. To think evil. Always thinking of how to destroy. That's a mind smitten with madness. You conjure up thoughts on why this brother hates you. He never did anything to you. How did you get to that point? What did he ever do to you or she ever do to you? And you make that all up in your mind. Watch this. Evil surmising. That's why it says in Corinthians 13. Yeah. First Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Doth not behave itself unseemly. Seek it not her own. It is not easily provoked. Think of no evil. Charity doesn't think evil. Having that spirit. That so when people separate themselves away from you, you see they move, it says preferring one another. So when you see people always pulling away, know something right here that they're struggling with. They could be evil surmising. Because a child of a spirit don't think evil. It doesn't think in that, that kind of way. We understand our strength is what? When we come together. All these things are broken, is what made us what broke us mentally. That we don't know how to associate, how to deal with each other. We will begin to backbite, argue each other. We'll begin to disrespect each other. And all that is because we broke the sins. And then we broke, we broke the laws. And then we're looking for solutions, but we're looking in all the wrong places. Watch this real quick. Go from that. I want to go to, uh, uh, to multiple personalities real quick. Uh, Luke 8. I want to say Luke 8, verse 20. I'm not there yet. Luke 8. Hmm. Where's it called? Look it up for me real quick. Wait, uh, Legion. Oh, verse 30. Luke 8, verse 30. I'm in Luke 9. That's the problem. Luke 8, verse 30. Start with verse 27. Luke chapter 8 and verse 27. And when he went forth to, excuse me, and when he went forth to land, there met him out of the city a certain man, which had devils a long time, and wear no clothes, neither abode in any house, but in the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him. And with a loud voice said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God, most high? I beseech thee, torment me not. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For oft times it had caught him. Now stop. He said he, he commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. What was the unclean spirit? It says, a certain man which had devils a long time. So that unclean spirit, he had devils on him. Read on. For oftentimes it had caught him, and he was kept bound with chains and fetters, and he broke the bands and was driven of the devil into the wilderness. Right. And he was many times, he was bound with chains. We ever seen that movie again? What's the movie again? What I do was, I forgot the name of the movie. Remember he had multiple personalities and he was breaking the chains? Split. Split. Yeah. All right. Same thing. That, that's, not, that's in the scriptures. He broke those chains. He had legions on him. Multiple personalities. Man, you see that with people in this truth. One minute they hot, cold, smiling, upset. <laughs> Read on. Verse 30. And Jesus asked him, saying, What is thy name? And he said, Legion. Because many devils entered into me. Right. He had many spirits on him. That's multiple personalities. Watch this. Go from that to uh, Matthew 12. We read this very often. Matthew 12, 28. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 28. But if I cast out devils by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. Or else... 
How can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil the goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house? Mm -hmm. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathered not with me scattered abroad. Mm -hmm. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto, him, unto men. Good on. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him. Neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Either make the tree good and his fruit good, or else make the tree corrupt and his fruit corrupt. For the tree is known by his fruit. Okay, uh, real quick, I want you to go up to verse, uh, I want to far. read verse 29. Verse 29. Uh, no, um... Yeah, 29, that's it. Verse 29. Or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man? Okay, so this whole analogy about binding the strong man, you have to bind him in sin. How can you come and destroy somebody? Only way you can do it is to bind that strong man into sin. Proverbs 5, 22. The book of Proverbs. Chapter 5 and verse 22. His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. He shall be holden with the cords of his sins. That's what I want. All right? Now let's jump on down. St. Matthew 12, 1243. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 43. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house from whence I came out. And when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself, with him, seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. So now, here we go again. Seven more spirits. We just read that about legions. You have multiple personalities. You have people that leave this truth, and at one time, their minds was right. Then all of a sudden now, then to what? Idolatry. Then to what? Uh, hatred. Unclean foods. Religion. More spirits jump on them. Each one of those spirits is what? Another demon that jumps onto them. That's when it says, and you know what? Many of them who leave, they think they're still in the Bible. They're looking for solutions. They're, oh, they're smitten with madness. Things that they understood that was basic understanding like Keeping the Passover becomes hard for them to understand. They're full of rage and anger in their spirits. All this is because of sin. What verse was that? Verse 45. Um, read verse 45. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 45. Then goeth he, and taketh with him seven other spirits, more wicked than himself. And they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first, even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. Now watch this. Watch, watch again, smitten with madness. I want to go to the book of Matthew 27. Oh, you know what? Let's, let's do this first. Let's go to Daniel's first. Let's read Daniel's. When Daniel's chapter four. Daniel four. Start with verse twenty nine. Daniel chapter four and verse twenty nine. At the end of twelve months he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built? For the house of thy kingdom, by the might of my power, and for the honor of thy, my majesty. While the word was in the king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven, saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee, and they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee. 
until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men and giveth it to whomsoever he will. We don't. The same hour was, excuse me, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. We don't. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. So look what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. Because he didn't give the Most High the praise, the Most High put a spirit on him. He was smitten with madness. He became like a beast of the field. You see many people walking the street like that right now, eating up the garbage like that. But here's the point behind all that that I wanted. What I wanted behind it, I wanted verse 34. Verse 34. At the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up my eyes unto heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And his what? And my understanding returned unto me. He says his understanding, he came back to his right frame of mind, was, came back to him, was returned to him. Read on. And I blessed the Most High. And, and what? I, and I blessed the Most High. And he blessed the Most High. Now this was a heathen who was smitten with madness. When his understanding came back to him, he did what? He blessed the Most High. Read on. And I praised and honored him. And I praised and honored him. That, li that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is from generation to generation. And his kingdom from generation to generation. That's the whole verse? Move on. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the hab inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Move on. At the same time, my reason returned unto me. For the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me. So it says, At the same time, my reason returned unto him. When what? When he acknowledged that God is the true and only God. So if we want to be redeemed out of this madness that we're in, the mentality, the, the PTSD and all we're suffering, we have to acknowledge that God, the Most High God, is the only God, that we're his people, we sinned against him, and then we'll be set free. Then we'll be set free here mentally. Read on. Read that verse, finish it. Verse 36. At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, my honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me. And I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Right, stop that. Go to First Kings 8. So he, the heathen understood that. How is it the heathen understand it that you must acknowledge the Most High as a true God? That's what we felt when we, when we decided that God wasn't that important. When we just serve the Most High with joyfulness and gladness of heart, he said, okay, now you're going to serve your enemies. And I'm going to smite them in madness. I'm going to take everything away from you. I'm going to make you realize that you need me. That you can't do this without me. Read. Uh, 8.46. First Kings chapter 8 and verse 46. If they sin against thee, for there is no man that sinneth not, and thou be angry with them, and deliver them to their enemy. So that they carry them away captives unto the land of the enemy far or near. Yet if they shall bethink themselves in the land whither they were carried captives and repent and make supplication unto thee in the land of them that carried them captives, saying, We have sinned, we have done perversely, we have committed wickedness, and so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul. God said, If, if they return to me with their mind, they have to return their mind to me. And in that, their soul is going to return to me. But they must return to That's what Nebuchadnezzar did. Nebuchadnezzar acknowledged. He's, the Lord is saying, you want to fix your condition, the matters that you're in, you must return back to my laws. Change the way you think. And in that, I'll lift those curses off of you. you read on. First Kings chapter 8 and verse 48. And so return unto thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies, which led them away captive, and pray unto thee toward their land, 
which thou gavest unto their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear thou their prayer and the supplication in heaven, thy, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause, and forgive thy people that have sinned against thee, and all their transgressions wherein they have transgressed against thee, and give them compassion before them. Give them compassion before them. Now watch this. We're going to wrap this up in a second. I want to go to the book of Deuteronomy 28 one more time, and I want to show you part of that smitten with madness again. So we understood that we have to return to him with our minds for him to return to us. Deuteronomy 28, I want you to go... I want you to read 66, uh, 65 through 67. Yes, sir. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 65. And among these nations thou shalt find no ease, neither shall the soul of thy foot have rest. But the Lord shall give thee there a trembling heart, and failing of eyes, and sorrow of mind. Mm -hmm. And thy life shall hang in doubt before thee, and thou shalt fear day and night and shall have none assurance of thy life. In the morning, thou shalt say, With God it were even. In the morning, you're going to wish it was evening time. Read on. And that even, thou shalt say, With God it were morning. That's, you understand how bad that is? He said, In the morning, you're going to be praying that the day is over. And at the end of the day, you're going to be praying that it was morning. Meaning what? God is going to make your life a total torment. Read on. For the fear of thine heart, wherewith thou shalt fear, and for the sight of thine eyes, which thou shalt see. So I'm going to give you an example of what you're going to see, why you're going to feel like that. Watch this. Run, jump to verse 50, 52. Verse 52. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high and fence walls come down, wherein thou tr trustedest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, Read on. which the Lord thy God have given thee. Read. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body. Stop. So it says, And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates until thy high walls and fence walls come down when thou trustest throughout all thy land. And he shall besiege thee in all thy gates throughout all thy land, which the Lord thy God have given thee. So try to think what happened to us back then. We was compassed with enemies. They besieged us. There was no food coming into the city. No water coming into it. You understand what happens with starvation? Starvation happens and what happens? Our mental capacity starts to wane. We lose, we begin, the, the madness kicks in. And what do we do next? Verse 53. And thou shalt eat the fruit of thine own body, the flesh of thy sons and of thy daughters, which the Lord thy God hath given thee, in the siege and in the straightness wherewith thine enemies shall distress thee. Read on. So that the man that is tender among you and very delicate, his eyes shall be evil toward his brother and toward his wife of his bosom and toward the remnant of his children which he shall leave. Jump on down to verse uh, 57. 57. And toward her young one that cometh out from between her feet and toward her children which she shall bear for she shall eat them for want of all things secretly in the siege and straightness, wherewith thine enemy shall distress thee in thy gates. So understand what's happening here. The most I said, I'm going to break you down so bad, I'm going to smite you with madness, that you're going to eat your own children. Now how does that happen? Does that happen over a period of time? No. You're without water. Go to Isaiah real quick. This is a smit with madness. As the music is driving me crazy. Oh, snap. Okay. Isaiah chapter 1. I want verse The whole stay of bread, the whole staff of water. One second. Uh, chapter 3, I'm sorry. 3 and 1. Isaiah, chapter 3 and verse 1. For behold, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, that take away from Jerusalem and from Judah, the stay of the staff, the whole stay of bread, and the whole stay of water. So the most high 
Remove from us bread and water. So what will happen? We began to eat our young. Look what happened. Jumped in the chapter. Um, same, same chapter. I don't know. Let's go to Lamentations. We're going to wrap it up right here because of that music. I got to. Lamentations. I want to deal with us eating all youngs. Yes. Lamentations, chapter 4, and verse 10. The hands of the pitiful women have sodden their own children. They will then meet in the destruction of the daughter of my people. We don't. The Lord hath accomplished his fury. He hath poured out his fierce anger and hath kindled a fire in Zion. And it hath devoured the foundation thereof. So it says, the, the hands, uh, verse 10, the hands of the pitiful women have sat and have cooked their own children. Imagine the, imagine the PSD behind that. And that all comes from sinning. For us breaking the law, the God said, I'm going to curse you. I'm going to punish you that you're going to be without food and water to the point that you're broken down so mentally you're going to cook your own children and eat them. These are things, and guess what? That's what it says in Matthew 24. Woe to them that give suck in this day. Don't think when grinding gets low in these last days again, these same things won't happen again. The ones that's going to escape those are the ones that's keeping the commandments. So listen, with that, we're going to end the class. I hope it. I'll pick up next week if the Lord spare life and continue with this, uh, um, this series of Smitten with Madness. But with that, I hope that you all was edified. Stay tuned. Bishop is coming on or... Uh, headquarters will be on at 5 o'clock, 5.30 East Coast time, all right? Stay strong in the Lord. We used to scream black power while Heron was pushed but at the end of the day, nothing's in vain. IUIC has been given a vision. The tents of Judah has risen. Many has attempted the mission. Minor murmuring, omitting, and missing the mark. Just reading that he had the flame of fire in his eyes gave us the spark. We on Paul's mission. We out on the road, purple and gold. From Mexico, Cuba, Haiti, Ghana, Sierra Leone 144,000 boots banging, concrete crackling These are how men repented at heart The scriptures is proof IUIC, we deliver the truth